solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. The seven trumpets blow at the end of the Christian era, just before the Lord Jesus Christ leaves the most holy place. The seven trumpets will blow. None of them have yet blown. The seven trumpets will blow just before the close of probation. And that's why this subject takes on such a monumental importance. There is no scriptural authority whatsoever that the trumpets blew at random throughout Christian history. There's no support for that at all. And so we must discard. We must discard that view of Revelation chapter 8. Now I'm going to tell you why. And this is very, very vital. It is dangerous to go back and defend Attila the Hun and Alaric the Goth and spend our time absorbed in that great, those so-called historical events because by being obsessed, as I find people obsessed, defending the seven trumpets historically, if we find ourselves obsessed with those seven trumpets, it keeps us from seeing what is right on our doorstep. It keeps us from being alert to being warned ourselves and to sound the warning to the world that the seven trumpets are about to blow. It is silencing our voices. This misplaced loyalty to something that will not stand up historically, will not stand up biblically, it will not stand up eschatologically. We are so obsessed with the past that we fail to see what is on our doorstep. And therefore, I am very hostile toward that old view because of this obsession that the seven trumpets are the seven first plagues. The difference is that the seven trumpets blow before the close of human probation and the seven last plagues blow after probation is closed. So the close of probation is the dividing line between these two sets of plagues. Now, let's take a look at the trumpets as literal events in our own time. The very thing that we're reading about in magazines and newspapers. It talks about a hail of fire coming down from the sky, pouring from the sky, in which time a third of all of the forests in the world will be set ablaze. Let's talk about that. Notice that it says a third. I think there's a clue there. Listen to it. It doesn't say all the forests of the world. It says a third. And the fact that it's only a third shows that there are two-thirds of mercy. This is not a totality of destruction. It shows that there is two-thirds of mercy and a third of judgment alerting the world. And we've got to keep that one in mind. Then, <coughs> <it's coughs> excuse me, it speaks about the grass of the world being on fire, a third of all the grass. And what is the grass? Wheat is a grass. Corn is a grass. Rye is a grass. So that a third of all of the wheat in the world will be burned up. We're going to talk about that a little more later on. Now, this should not surprise us that it talks about a hail of fire coming down from the sky 
we are passing continuously through a whole lot of celestial garbage that the scientists of the world are afraid we're going to hit this stuff or it's going to hit us. That's what it's talking about here. Now there are six results about this hail of fire. When all of when a third of all of the trees in the world are on fire, the great forests of Canada, the northern tier of the United States, the 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 the, uh, the great forests of, of Siberia, in the northern part of the continent of Europe, and a lot of the trees in the Amazon Valley. When they burn, there will be smoke that will go up into the air, and there will be a dark day as a result of that smoke. That should not surprise us. I am not impressed. I want to, I want to say this nicely, but I, but I want to say it forcefully. I am not impressed with 1780 as a sign of the soon return of Christ. Not at all. My, my feeling is that if Ellen White were alive today, and to supernaturally guide this church that she would edit great controversy. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm a, less of a believer in the inspiration of Ellen White. The latter part of that book is as absolutely intact. But there's a lot of it in the front part of the book that needs serious editing. We wouldn't dare, however, do what they did in 1919 to appoint, uh, and I mean in 1888, to appoint a committee to edit the book. We wouldn't dare, because a cry of horror would go out from Seventh-day Adventists all over North America if we were to say the book needed editing. But it does need editing. But once again, I want to assure you, this does not detract in the slightest degree from the inspiration of Ellen White. Not in my mind, not at all. There's too much, too much overwhelming evidence of her inspiration that, that, we, that is, un, is un, undeniable. Now, not only when this fiery hail comes down would ignite all the forests, it will ignite a thousand cities. Because this stuff is coming down it's not going to burn up in the atmosphere like ordinarily a little meteorite with the friction of the air turns white hot, burns up before it hits the ground. These pieces are big enough that in spite of their fiery flame, they are coming down and striking the surface of the earth and there will be a thousand cities will be on fire. And Los Angeles will be on fire. And so will San Francisco. And so will New York. And so will Chicago and Paris and London. A thousand cities will be on fl will be aflame, and this world will know that the character of a righteous God has been offended by the immorality of this of this society. We have no morals anymore. This is this world is a stench in the nostrils of God, and it will soon be seen that God's con the conscience and the character of God has has been offended. Now, because all of the crops of the world are going to be on fire, there will be a shortage of food. That will make Somalia look like a garage sale. Then if you notice, as we read in that chapter about prayer, I'm telling you, folk, this, this trumpet, this eighth chapter of Revelation indicates that there will be a spirit of prayer go across this world, that there will be prayers like has never been seen before. This shows us that those prayers are effective, that God is hearing prayer. And I want to tell you, if they tell you and me to be in church next Sunday and get together for and pray for the survival of our world and of our nation, I want to tell you, brother and sister, you better be there next Sunday. 
Because if you are not there to pray for the survival of this nation and the world, you are an enemy of the human race. The pressure. We have no idea the kind of pressure that's going to be put upon those of us who are keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath is going to become an issue. And those who keep the Sabbath will be considered the enemies of the human race. I don't think we've begun to envision what we're talking about here. Now let's talk about the second trumpet. <coughs> and this is a burning mountain. A great mountain burning falls into the sea. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a meteorite. Not little pieces of hail but a big piece, all in one portion, all in one piece, that will hit the oceans. Now we have to remember that these asteroids that are flying out there are traveling at 122,000 miles an hour. And one of those big dudes would hit the Pacific Ocean, and it will create a wave, uh, I would say conservatively a mile high maybe two miles. And as a result of that, the ships, it spoke about the ships. A third of all the ships. Did you notice that in the scripture? Can you imagine for a moment that a ship is picked up by this massive wave and is lifted a mile or two into the sky and then the wave drops away the supportive wave drops away and that ship falls a vertical mile or two. Can you imagine the horror in the people on board that ship? Think about that. When the scripture talks about a third of all of the ships in the sea being destroyed, it is talking about ships spelled S-H-I-P-S. That's what it's talked about. There is no reason in the world why we should interpret this symbolically when it is in, in very clear that it is real. All right. Now, not only will the, these uh, ships be destroyed, but the seaports. The seaports that have become like Sodom for wickedness. We're going to read that in a moment. But when that wave comes in, the beachfront in California will be in Phoenix, Arizona. And there will be no San Diego. There will be no Carlsbad. There will be no Long Beach. There will be no Los Angeles. There will be no San Francisco. There will be no Coos Bay. There will be no Portland. There will be no Lincoln City. There will be no Seattle. That what happened in the great earthquake of Lisbon, when that water came in and it went out and it carried 10,000 people out into the Atlantic Ocean in 1755. But that thing is going to happen again. And this time, it's going to carry millions of bodies. Millions of bodies are going to be carried out into the ocean and never found. That's what we're looking at. Now it says that a third of all the life dies in the sea. Because when you superheat water, you put that big rock in there and it heats the water. And when you boil water, you boil the oxygen out. It tastes flat. And the fish have to have oxygen in order to live. And because they don't have any oxygen, the bodies of the fish will rise to the surface. It will be washed ashore. And if you like the smell of decaying fish, you will enjoy that day. Because the stench is going to be something terrible. You talk about perplexity of nations. Because all of these things will cause the distress, the distress of nations. Now, I'm going to make a comment or two about the great earthquake. <coughs> the 
because the great earthquake comes before the seven trumpets blow. They are a signal. They are about to blow. I wonder if we realize that we are preparing this world for the greatest earthquake that's ever been. Why? How? Under the states of Nebraska and Kansas and Oklahoma and the western part of Texas, there's a vast underground aquifer. Aqua, you know, means water. And I lived in the state of Kansas, and I saw when I went out on the farms owned by Adventist farmers, and they had pipes going down in the ground that big, and the water, and they had them all over the place, and they were pumping the water out from under the ground. And they were watering the wheat fields. And they were watering the corn fields in, the, in, in Nebraska and in Iowa. And they were watering the cotton fields on the western part of Texas, but they're not watering them anymore because the aquifers died. And all the aquifer under the western part of Texas is dead, and there are no cotton crops in western Texas. Now, what have we done? We pulled this water out from under the ground, and it's not been replenished. As a result, we are creating a geological hazard that with the least little bit of shake, that the entire states of Nebraska and Kansas and Oklahoma and western Texas will all fall into the cavity. How far it will fall, I don't know. That we are setting the world up by the very fact of our, the utilization of the water. We have exploited the universe. We've exploited this thing. Now, another thing we've done. We have pulled the oil out from underneath the ground. And we're pumping billions and billions of barrels a day because we're using it. And we're pumping this oil out from underneath the ground. You know what? We're setting up the tectonic plates, as they call them, the shifting plates of the continents. We're, we're setting them up to move. So, it is these scriptures come to my mind. Revelation 16, 18, there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. That takes on new meaning. And Matthew 24, 22, except those days be shortened, there would what? No flesh be saved. All of the possibilities are that out of the population of the world, there will probably be two billion people who will die in the sound of the first two trumpets. Just the first two trumpets. Ellen White wrote this first paragraph. Solemn events are yet to transpire Trumpet after trumpet is yet to be sounded. Vial after vial poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. Scenes of tremendous interest are right upon us. Revelation 6 and 7 are full of meaning. Terrible are the judgments of God revealed. The seven angels stood before God to receive their commission. To them were given seven trumpets. The Lord was going forth to punish the inhabitants of the earth. It doesn't sound like Ellen White believed that the trumpets were in the past, does it? She didn't believe that. We are nearing the time when the prophecies of the book of Revelation are to be fulfilled. Now watch about the buildings being set on fire. Last Friday morning, just before I awoke, a very impressive scene was presented before me. I seemed to awake from sleep, but not in my home. From the windows I could behold a terrible conflagration. Great balls of fire were falling upon houses, and from these balls fiery arrows were flying in every direction. It was impossible to check the fires that were kindled, and many places were being destroyed. The terror of the people was indescribable. After a time I awoke and found myself at home. In the night I thought I was in a room but not in my own house. I heard expression after expression. I rose up quickly in bed and saw from my window large balls of fire Jetting out were sparks in the form of arrows, and buildings were being consumed in, in a very few minutes. The entire block of buildings was falling, and the screeching and the mournful groans came distinctly to my ears. I cried out in my raised position to learn what was happening. Where am I? It was a voice that spoke, Be not afraid. Nothing shall harm you. Let's look at the thousands of cities. The inhabitants of the ungodly cities, so soon to be visited by calamities, have been cruelly neglected. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be warned of these coming judgments. Oh, that God's people had the sense of the impending destruction of how many cities? Thousands of cities. Now almost given to idolatry. Now let's talk about the dark day. This is the sharpest day 
that I have ever witnessed in the carriage in the storm, she's talking about a railroad. She's on a railroad train. I thought of the day, I thought of the day when the judgments of God would be poured out upon the world. When blackness and horrible darkness would clothe the heavens as sackcloth of hair. My imagination anticipated what it must be in that period when the Lord's mighty voice shall give, shall give commission to his angels, go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. I want to say something about this. And that is when the smoke surrounds the world that crops don't grow. Did you know that? Take sunshine. There's not only going to be a famine, there's not going to be anything growing. We have to factor all of this in. Now, let's talk about the asteroids. There is a roar as of a coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. The inhabited islands disappear. The seaports that have become like Sodom for wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waves. You notice the S on the word seaport? It says seaports, doesn't it? Great hailstones, every one about the weight of a talent, are doing their work of destruction. The proudest cities of the earth are laid low. The lordly palaces upon which the world's great men have lavished their wealth in order to glorify themselves are crumbling to ruin before their eyes. I won't take time to read the rest of this. I think, I think that it is, is, very, is very, very clear. But I, 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 I'm pondering. I am really pondering about what to do what to do with what, with what I know. What are we going to do with what we as Adventists know? Look at the news magazines of the world. Newsweek. Doomsday Science. New theories about comets, asteroids, and how the world might what? End. Jupiter's Big Bang. Could it happen here? Yes. Astronomy Magazine. You see what it says there. Can we prevent the end of civilization? Cosmic Crash, Time Magazine. A shattered comet is about to hit Jupiter. Could it happen here on Earth? What's that last word? Yes. Here's one of a scandal sheet. I hate to even show it. Nostradamus prophecy. You know what Nostradamus means? What does it mean? Our Lady. Notre is our. Dan is woman, or Our Lady. Talk about the Virgin Mary. Meteor showers in 1999. What have I got here? Look at this one. Meteor that could end the world. One nearly did in January, say the astronomers. I got my groceries two days ago. Warning. Scientists fear asteroid hit the Earth. You know, the thing that impressed me about this, 200 foot high tidal waves will kill up to 100,000. Ha! Jeez, that's minor. The thing that impresses me is that the people of the world are, are, are speaking out and we are silent as a tomb, aren't we? We're afraid, we're afraid to speak out. I spoke on this subject a couple of weeks ago in a little town south of my hometown of Roseburg. And I said to one of the elders of the church, I said, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that maybe we ought to uh, rent the town hall. This is in my mind. You pray about it. I'm praying about it. And have just one meeting. Just one. Invite everybody in this little town to come. Anybody that's interested. 
I don't know what title to put on the meeting, but it'd be one one meeting, just one, in which we would open the Bible to Revelation chapter 8 and talk to them about what's going on. That that we we owe them something, you know. You that's right. You you knew and you you never said a thing. You see. So I've come to the conviction that it's time to free ourselves totally from the shackles of the traditional view of the trumpets. Begin to understand the trumpets. They come at the end of the Christian era, at the beginning of the last month. The last days just before the Lord leaves his high priestly ministry. That is as clear in my mind as it, as it can possibly be. The seven trumpets are a warning that probation is closing. That the judgments of God are being seen in the land. Because the morality of a righteous God has, has been offended. So what are we going to do with the information we've got? What are you folks going to do about it? When that day comes that the people who attend a meeting like this would say, you know, there was a minister who came. I think he was a Seventh-day Adventist that told us about this. Can you believe that a seed would be planted? Can you believe that? How many can believe that? We've got to find out. Because they told us that this would come. So, it's our responsibility to warn the people of the danger that they are in. The book of Revelation, I'm reading Ellen White. I close. The book of Revelation must be open to the people. The truth it contains must be proclaimed. The people must have an opportunity to prepare for the events that are soon to transpire. Ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists, the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be carefully studied. Let's forget about the trivia, this garbage of the world, people selling themselves out for a rock music record or a, a, for a, a pornographic book, selling their souls for eternity for this trash. Let's separate ourselves from the things of this world and realize that the real joy of living, isn't it? The real joy of living is living with our God and His Savior, our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. Is that right? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we've had here together this morning around your book. Thank you, Lord, for the solemnity of what you have given us a responsibility that is unknown to the masses of the religious world while the people of the secular world seem to know something is going to happen, Lord, help us to rise and to let our voice be heard like a trumpet and to let the world know that Jesus is Savior and Lord and that eternity is coming when all of the tragedies and all of the pain, the worries, the fears of this world will be set aside forever and forever and we shall know the joy of being with him whom to lo is life eternal. Bless each one of us and through us our families and loved ones. Get us ready for that day of all days when the gates of pearl will open never to be shut that we might enter in and praise the Lord Jesus Christ in all of eternity, world without end. Amen. Amen. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Jesus is coming soon.